Foreign Minister, thank you very much for speaking to USA Today um, at this momentous time. It's good to be with you. Um, tomorrow, on the 39th anniversary of the Iran hostage crisis uh, and the U.S. Embassy takeover in Tehran, uh, President Donald Trump's administration will reimpose all the crushing economic penalties that were lifted by the Obama administration as part of the 2015 nuclear deal. Is Iran ready for this? Well, the uh, question is, is the international community ready for it? Uh, because uh, the current administration is uh, basically asking uh, all members of the international community to violate international law. It's not itself only violating, it's asking others to violate too. Because as you know, uh, when we agreed on uh, the nuclear deal or JCPOA, uh, it was enshrined in a Security Council resolution. And the Security Council resolution, which was actually not only voted for by the United States, but sponsored uh, by the United States, by the previous administration, but nevertheless the U.S. government, uh, calls on all countries to help implement the resolution and not to do anything that would prevent its implementation. Now the United States itself is preventing its implementation and asking other countries not to engage in economic transactions with us, which means preventing the implementation of the resolution because the objective of the resolution was to normalize uh, Iran's business relations with the rest of the world. So the United States is in fact punishing people and countries for observing international law and rewarding them for violating international law. So whether, I mean, Iran is used to U.S. sanctions. We've had them for almost 39 years. Uh, we haven't had uh, an easy history with the United States, but it did not start uh, on November 4th, uh, 1980. It started long before that, in 1953. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we have been used to measures that were never legal, but this time it is exceptionally illegal because it is asking people to violate the Security Council resolution. We will live. Uh, we have 7,000 years of history. We've lived through more difficult times. For eight years, we lived through a war that was imposed on Iran, and everybody supported the aggressor. Saddam Hussein, the United States supported him, Soviet Union supported him, the Europeans supported him. I mean, I can give you what they gave him. The Soviets gave him MiG fighters, the, uh, the French gave him Mirage fighters, the Brits gave him uh, chieftain tanks, the Americans gave him AWACS reconnaissance, the Germans gave him chemical weapons, so everybody pitched in and the Saudis gave him $75 billion worth of assistance. So everybody pitched in, we survived. And now, at that time we were isolated. Now the United States is isolated. You heard yesterday the Europeans again made a statement against the sanctions. Uh, whether the private businesses will go along, it's a different story. But the international community is, is uh, standing against these sanctions. Right. I, I would like to come back to that point about the Europeans and what they're, they're doing okay. in their efforts and so on. But, but if I could just press you on the, you know, how Iran is coping point to do with the sanctions. Because I, 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 you probably are not aware, I was in Iran for the first time this summer. Um, and, you know, I met... Uh, many Iranians, and they were not panicking, you know, they were not desperate. Um, but, you know, they were having some trouble buying so, some, some bare necessities and all the rest of it. You know, there was, there was weariness, there was frustration, um, you know, and there was at this sort of decades of animosity between Iran and the United States. Um, but I wanted to ask you, I mean, what do you, what do you say to kind of average Iranians now who are kind of caught in the middle between us, who just want to get on with living their lives? Yeah. You know? No, this, uh, and they have every right to. Well, uh, bare necessities, I would disagree. Okay. Uh, the, the government is providing uh, subsidies so that uh, the necessities for people's lives would be provided at previous prices. Mm -hmm. But nobody claims that economic sanctions don't hurt. Economic sanctions always hurt, but they don't achieve the policy objectives that they intend to achieve. Sometimes they achieve 
exactly the opposite, as was the case in the previous round of sanctions that the United States imposed on Iran. But what I will say to the average Iranian was that for us, talking to the United States was a taboo. We broke that taboo. We spoke to the United States. We had the longest negotiations with the United States. We reached an agreement with the United States, not a two-page agreement, but a 150-page agreement. And the United States decided to walk away from it. It wasn't our fault that the U.S. is not a reliable negotiating partner. It's a problem that the international community is facing. And the U.S. has not just walked away from the Iran deal. It walked away from the, the Paris Climate Convention. It walked away from the arms control agreement with Russia. It walked away from NAFTA. It walked away from Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, it walked away from UNESCO. It walked away from uh, Human Rights Council. Uh, uh, basically, uh, there are rare exceptions where it hasn't walked away. So this is the type of administration that we, we are dealing with. And I'm sure the Iranian community, uh, the, the Iranian population, while uh, understandably unhappy with, with the situation right now, can also understand uh, that it's not the fault of the government. Uh, but it is because we have a rogue regime in Washington uh, that doesn't live by any principle of international law. On the European point, I mean, the Europeans have been in, ins insisting for months they're going to help, you know, prop up the deal. They've they've come up with this concept of the special purpose vehicle, um, you know, this kind of financial mechanism that's somehow going to ensure that trade goes on. Um, but, um, you know, is it kind of ultimately doomed to failure? This this concept. I mean, I'm hoping that you can kind of first of all walk us through a little bit what this thing actually is, you know, and, and what it looks like, um, and how it really can defy Washington, you know, because Washington is looking at this closely and saying, you know, whatever the Europeans come up with, we're not going to allow, uh, allow the sanctions to be avoided. Well, you see, here's the problem. The United States is exercising its economic power beyond the normal acceptable limits. And whenever you do that, you risk a backlash. Now, this backlash is starting. It doesn't mean that it will succeed this time. There is no guarantee that it will. But it's a seed of a new international monetary system, in spite of the US overwhelming influence on the current international monetary system. People are fed up with the United States telling them what to do and what not to do. Simply fed up. And now you see in between many countries, we're in Turkey right now, Turkey has financial arrangements with many countries, with us, with Russia, with China, with Ukraine, with other countries, in order to use our own currencies. We have that arrangement with many. So the more the United States puts pressure on various countries, so the so-called weaponization of U.S. economy or weaponization of, of U.S. dollar, the more it does that, the more people around the world will be inclined to take measures to avoid it. Now, this special purpose vehicle is one measure that is specifically designed as a first step to deal with the Iranian situation. But its objective, its ultimate objective, as we've heard from the Europeans, is not simply to insulate trade between Iran and Europe or between Iran and its uh, third-party partners, but in fact to insulate themselves. It's not a favor to Iran. To insulate themselves and their financial relations in times that it would not be uh, in the liking of the United States from U.S. pressure. So that's the seed of a new international reality, which may not bear fruit uh, soon enough to address our concern, but it will be the beginning of a new phase of international economic relations. So I have not heard that articulation from the Europeans myself in terms of this is a vehicle that will be used beyond the Iranian scenario. Yes, the, the, and in fact, they're, they're kind of quibbling about where they can, you know, which country would actually host it. Because you know, if you locate it in France, 
this this mechanism, or you know, they put the infrastructure in France, and suddenly Washington will come down on France, you know, and if you put it in Belgium, you know, and so on and so forth. So there are some uh, it's real a, concerns. It's a mechanism. About. It's a multi-party mechanism. It's not a, a single country mechanism. It's owned by several countries, and wherever it will be located, uh, it the, the country may face an initial pressure from the United States, but. Uh, what the Europeans are envisaging, and, and I, I think this question is best addressed uh, to the Europeans, but what they have told us is that the first stage would be a special purpose vehicle for Iran, and then the second stage, which may take them a year or so to, to build, would be a special purpose entity that would be much more uh, comprehensive and go much wider than, than only business with Iran. Oil. Uh, we heard last last night um, in the United States that there are going to be eight countries that will get waivers. We don't know exactly which countries those are yet. There's speculation it might be you know, India, South Korea, China, Turkey. Um, you know, I, I've been told that there's other sort of back channels that and ways that Iran can continue to sell oil um, for years. The Israelis, of course, have. have you know, allege that you've got super tankers in the Persian Gulf, you know, with lots of oil just kind of waiting there under false flags and to send, you know, around the world. What are the other ways? I mean, are, you know, how can you continue to sell uh, oil, you know, beyond these waivers? You know, is there, is there other channels uh, for you? You see, when President Trump um, and his administration made the statement that they will bring Iranian oil exports to zero, we said that was a dream that will never come true. Now we are uh, just before November 4th and we have seen that we were right. Uh, they were bluffing about this attempt to prevent Iran from selling oil. They know what would be the impact of the international economy and they'll never be able to do it, period. We have always had various ways of selling our oil, and we will continue to have ways of selling our oil. Uh, and the United States will continue to fail to implement that policy. But what the United States is promoting, because when you do this, you promote corruption, you promote uh, lack of transparency, people, countries, will continue to trade. What the United States is doing is to help, uh, to, to prevent transparency, to prevent open trade. If we cannot do an open way of trading our uh, commodities, if we cannot get what we want to get from open, transparent international transactions, we will not lie down and wait to die. We will do it. We will do it through whatever means that is necessary in order to get it done. But those mechanisms uh, have a propensity to invite corruption and lack of transparency, unfortunately. The midterms, the US midterms, as I'm sure you're aware, are coming up this week. Um, early next week. Um, you know, some people build this as like a, a dress, or you could argue it's a dress rehearsal for one of the world's, you know, for the U.S.'s most consequential White House race in two years' time. Um, what does Iran, you know, what, what do you want to see happen? I mean, is, is it as simple as, um, you know, democratic gains are good for Iran, you know, because well, they give one, a check? In, in one sentence, we're not pinning any hopes. On this or 2020 U.S. elections, uh, you see, what distinguishes Iran from some of U.S. clients in the region is that we have survived not only in spite of the U.S., but against the U.S. Uh, for some U.S. clients, it does matter a lot, because if it's uh, a favorable administration, it can open their hands to bomb Yemen out of existence, to kill their citizens, to abduct another country's prime minister, 
but if it's another administration, uh, it won't be drastically different, but they'll be a bit more limited. For Iran, I mean, we've gone through Democratic and Republican administrations in the past, and more or less, uh, we have been uh, on the uh, hostile side of U.S. policy. Uh, different varying degrees of hostility. Doesn't mean that some have been friendly to us. All of them have been hostile uh, with varying degrees. So we're not pinning too much hope. We rely on ourselves. Um, so Trump, as you know, has, has said he's willing to sit down with President Rouhani. No, no, you know, conditions, preconditions attached. Your government has made it quite clear that you're not interested in doing that. Um, why? I mean, isn't it always kind of more fruitful, ultimately, to have diplomacy, to have talks, yeah. you know, have exploratory discussions, you know, rather than retreat from diplomacy? Sure. It is always mm, useful to have diplomacy. Uh, and we're not just saying it, uh, we exercised it. Uh, I sat down with Secretary Kerry uh, after basically 37 years of no talks between Iran and the United States at any level. And then we did it at the highest diplomatic level. And then we spent two years, basically day and night, negotiating in one way or the other together. And we achieved positive results. So we thought that that would show the uh, value of diplomacy, that you cannot gain through any other means. But this administration does not believe in diplomacy. This administration believes on imposition. You see, for negotiations to succeed, for any negotiation to, su to succeed, you do not need mutual trust. Because when you sit with an adversary or even a friend in international relations, you cannot simply trust them. Otherwise, you don't need to negotiate with them. You will just tell them that I'll do this, and they'll tell you I'll do this, and that will be the end of the story. But you sit down, you write things on the paper, you sign them, or you have them adopted by the Security Council, because you do not trust each other. But while mutual trust is not a requirement to start negotiations, mutual respect is a requirement. And mutual respect starts with respecting yourself, respecting your signature, respecting your own word. You cannot say that two years down the road there is another administration which might not respect the agreement of this administration. In a year and a half, in two years, in three years, we will have a different administration. You know what type of jungle we would have? If any agreement that you reach with another country, with a democratically elected government in another country, then the next democratically elected government, and the fact of the matter is usually in democracies, administration that succeed each other are not friendly to the previous administration. Usually there is uh, change of uh, sure. uh, Just I mean, office from, from one president to the next. So if, you, if you're if negotiating for two years, as we did, for an agreement that would only stand for another two years, then it, it would be crazy to, to start negotiating. We now have an agreement with the United States, not only with the United States, but five other countries, and not only with six countries, but the European Union, and it is included in a Security Council resolution. For somebody to simply say, I don't like it, I won't walk away from it, because I believe I'm powerful enough to do it. So what is the guarantee that they won't do it with the next resolution uh, agreement? Just they say, let me, uh, <laughs> let me tell you what they say. They say it's because it wasn't ratified by Congress, that it was a personal agreement between President Obama and uh, the Iranian government. I'll tell them, that first of all, it is included in a Security Council resolution. Security Council is not, although President Trump may consider uh, the chamber as a uh, room in the White House, as he tried to do uh, last month, but it's not. It, it's, it's an official organ of the United Nations. Even putting Security Council resolution aside, the United States just walked out 
of a treaty that had been ratified by the Senate, the 1955 treaty between Iran and the U.S., on which the International Court of Justice ordered the United States to stop some of the sanctions. The U.S. simply walked out of it because it didn't like the order of the, of the International, Criminal, uh, International Court of Justice. Right. Can I just, just, to, just to, I just want to press you on the other point slightly, which is, if I'm following your logic, though, you know, you keep on saying it's this administration that you can't trust, that you can't negotiate with. Does that imply that there, if there was a different administration, you would at least consider having exploratory discussions, not necessarily the negotiations, because I don't think negotiations are what's being offered. I think it's just having meetings to, to get in the same room and start talking. Oh, well, we were in the same room. I, myself and Secretary Tillerson were in the same room. Uh, and we did talk, uh, but, but uh, everybody else did too. And everybody told him that JCPOA is a reasonable document, that this nuclear deal is a reasonable document. And three of the countries that were sitting around the table were closest allies of the United States, have been for the past, whatever, 70 years. And they told him that this is the best deal you can get. And he simply said, I represent a president who doesn't think so. So going into a room uh, and sitting down with a representative of, of this administration to explore what? And I'm not saying that we cannot negotiate with this administration, so we will negotiate with the next administration. I'm just laying the foundations for a fruitful dialogue. It doesn't have to be the next administration. It has to be a next approach, a different approach. It doesn't have to be a different administration. It requires a different approach. Different atmosphere. <laughs> not atmosphere, approach. Approach. No, okay. I mean, atmo we, we never negotiated in a positive atmosphere. Actually, Iran and the United States have a lot of differences. So we negotiated in an atmosphere of difference, of difference of view, of difference of interest, of difference of perspective. But we did reach an agreement on the topic that we were focusing on. So are there any, um, is there any contact now? No. None whatsoever, at None any whatsoever, level? At any level. None for the foreseeable future? Uh, well, I, I can, I can see some discussion on, on the humanitarian uh, issues of prisoners uh, in the foreseeable future, but uh, for the time being, that would be limited to that. Um, Saudi Arabia, do you feel vindicated a little bit in the context of you know what's been happening or what happened with the Washington Post columnist? That you know all indications are that he was being murdered. Um, you know, either directly or indirectly, you know, with involvement from the Saudi state, you obviously have a very difficult relationship with them. I mean, do you feel like, you know, somehow um, you were being ignored on them and, and this sheds a different kind of light on that country? Or Well, this is not something that we would be very pleased to see, uh, because unfortunately a person uh, has been murdered uh, in, a, in a very brutal way. Uh, and I don't think the international community needed this. Just look at the, past, the history of the past 40 years. Who provided $70 billion to Saddam Hussein? Who created the Taliban? Whose citizens were involved in the September 11 attacks? Who supported the uh, ISIS in, in Syria? Who is bombing Yemeni civilians? Who abducted another country's prime minister and kept him in captivity for three weeks? So, I mean, lo look at these realities. The United States has been not only making the wrong choice, but the West in general have been sending the wrong signal. Basically, literally telling the Saudi royal family that you can get away with murder. And they really believed it. And they thought they could get away with murder. Because unfortunately they have been getting away with murder in Yemen. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, um, you know, on the, re on the regional uh, issues, you know, um, as you kind of been pointing out, obviously Iran blames the U.S. for exasperating all sorts of uh, issues 
across the region. If you, if you flip that over, you know, the U.S. says that Iran is spending billions of, of dollars to fund global terrorism, you know, and, and it's, you know, <clears throat> nuclear program and is generally, you know, sowing discord and confusion ar ar around the, the Mideast. Um, you know, do you accept that Iran is complicit in, 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 in some of these various theaters around the region? Because it seems like you have two countries that are sort of accusing each other of the same thing. But, we, know, but both countries can't be right. We don't need to accuse each other. We just look at the facts. Starting again. Who was behind Al-Qaeda? Who, who created Al-Qaeda? Tell me who. Was it Iran? Or was it the U.S. in order to fight the Soviets? Who supported Saddam Hussein? Was it Iran? When Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait, who had been supporting him for the last, for the preceding eight years? Who supported the referendum in Kurdistan? Who is occupying the territory of Syria? Who is instigating ethnic problems inside Syria by allowing Kurds to take over Arab land? Just as foot soldiers for the United States, for the US to have a foothold in the region. Who is supporting the war in Yemen? The killing of innocent people. Are we bombing the innocent people in Yemen? You're not bombing people, but if I can, if I can say so, I mean, you know, the allegations that you're those arming, are allegations. Arming, those arming are the, the no, 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 those, those are allegations. But but the fact of the matter is, put allegations aside. The fact of the matter is, Saudi aircraft, most of which are American built, are dropping bombs on school buses. Now you do that to anybody, and they defend themselves. People, I mean, Yemenis, fought well-equipped armies long before the Iranian Revolution with stones, and they defeated them. Unfortunately, Saudi Arabia did not read history. They thought they could defeat the Yemenis in three weeks. We offered to the United States, I offered to John Kerry, the possibility of a ceasefire as soon as it started, the Saudis rejected it and said that we can win militarily in three weeks' time, as they thought they could win militarily in Syria in three weeks' time. Now it's seven years in Syria, almost four years in Yemen, and we have continued bloodshed. Now in Syria, who is behind the Astana process? Who is trying to bring the hostilities to an end? If anything, the United States is trying to prevent that. It is Iran, Russia, and Turkey working together against the U.S. and its allies. So just look at the realities. I'm not making accusations. I'm not calling this group a terrorist or the other group. I'm simply using the available information based on Security Council resolutions. I don't sit in the Security Council. The Security Council, can, where the United States is a permanent member, considers Daesh, uh, ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, Taliban, and Al-Qaeda to be terrorist organizations. The rest are national designations. Th these four organizations are those who are considered globally. There is a consensus about them. And the United States or its allies have either created them, financed them, Arm them, continue to support them. Do you do you accept that your government has financed, you know, groups in Syria, groups in Lebanon? I mean, do you do you accept that? Because this seems to be one of the main things that, you know, the State Department, Secretary Pompeo talks about week in, week out. Yeah, yeah, he about, does. You know, he does. But, but but we are in Syria, on the invitation of the Syrian government, fighting terrorists who are on the United Nations list of terrorists not on a self-serving U.S. list of terrorists. We went to Iraqi Kurdistan to help them defeat ISIS. We've been consistent. And those we support in Lebanon are a part of the Lebanese government. We actually support the Lebanese government. We don't imprison the Prime Minister of Lebanon. 
you know. I mean, the United States, instead of making all these self-serving allegations, which are not self-serving really, because they hurt U.S. interests, instead of making these allegations, which serve only a few clients, Israel and Saudi Arabia, the United States should look at the reality. Who's bombing Yemen? Who's imprisoning another country's prime minister? Who is helping Daesh? Who is helping Nusra? Whose arms are in the hands of Daesh? You've seen the reports that Daesh was using American arms provided by Saudi Arabia. These are the realities. These are not my allegations. These are realities. And these groups are UN-designated groups, not US-designated groups. And there is a difference. Because the United States designates whoever it doesn't like as a terrorist. Let me tell you an example. It may be a historical example. In 1984, the United States removed Saddam Hussein as a state sponsor of terrorism. In the same year, it put Iran on the list. You know why? Because the United States at that time wanted to go and support Saddam Hussein in the war against Iran. So don't expect me to consider the United States list of terrorism designations to have any credibility if it removes Saddam Hussein from the list and puts Iran on the list. I'm not sure how we get past the both countries seem to have different facts. <laughs> no, no, um, we, don't, we don't work on alternative facts. <laughs> President okay. Trump likes alternative facts. So can we talk a little bit about some of the um, the news that, you know, recently out of Denmark that there is a, uh, the Danish security services that they foiled an attack. Um, that comes out, you know, by, they say, um, you know, an exiled Iranian dissident group um, that came after a similar allegation in France. Uh, that followed, I believe, a similar one in Finland. You know, there's, there's been a few of these. Um, you know, they're all pointing the finger at Iran. Um, and I appreciate the Iranian government's um, stance on that, you know, that, that uh, this intelligence came from Assad, you know, and that, that therefore it's not credible. Um, why would France and Denmark in particular, what would they have stand to gain at this point by trying to isolate you know, Europe and the US, given that those countries are so yeah, on board we, with the nuclear deal. Yeah, we live in, we live in a world where uh, complicated uh, intelligence operations are the order of the day. Uh, what makes uh, us different from those who make the allegations is that we've offered, I spoke to the Danish foreign minister last night, and I offered to him that we are prepared to conduct a joint investigation, mm -hmm. that we are prepared to send a high-level intelligence officer. Now, we're talking about facts and we're talking about allegations. Let's look at the facts first. France houses, provides safe haven to an organization that was on the U.S. list of terrorist organizations until 2012 and on the EU list of terrorist organizations until about the same time, MEK. Denmark provides safe haven and support to an organization and people who went on international television, financed by Saudi Arabia, operating out of London, called Iran International, claiming, not condoning, claiming responsibility for an operation that was conducted in Iran, an operation that the government of Denmark itself condemned as a terrorist operation. So these are facts on the ground. This gentleman is not an obscure face. It's not an alleged situation. This gentleman, in person, went on TV live claimed responsibility for, it, for an operation that the government of Denmark considers and condemns as a terrorist operation. You have an organization in Paris that has been on the list of uh, US as well as Europe as a terrorist organization. These are facts. Now you have allegations. You have allegations that 
somebody connected with Iran tried to assassinate this person, somebody connected with Iran tried to uh, put explosives in that, in that uh, meeting that they had in Paris. These are allegations. Those are facts. So if anybody should provide explanation, it would be France and Denmark. Why are they giving refuge, safe haven to known terrorists? Why are, not, why are they not prosecuting them? What we have done is to, we have officially asked both France and the United States to prosecute these people. We have asked the United Kingdom to look at the fact that there is a television station that is financed by Saudi Arabia that broadcasts live terrorist claims and applauds it. These are facts. The way we have approached these facts is through the legal means of telling them that you need to deal with it. Now, you have allegations. Well, why are so many of these facts, I mean, as you let me tell you, them, let misunderstood, me, though? Because, I mean, it seems like again and again let me you tell feel you, that let your me facts tell you, are not just, coming across. Just, just, look at the, just look at the chronology. On the day that our president arrives in Switzerland, Mossad helps France and Belgium to foil that plot of uh, bomb attack against MEK. On the day Europe was supposed to announce the establishment of SPV, Denmark makes the announcement with the help of Mossad that they have arrested this person. And what we do is we ask both of them, let's look at this together. Let's investigate. Now France has been forthcoming, and that is why we are discussing this with France. I hope that Denmark will be forthcoming because I offered this to the Foreign Minister of Denmark last night, and I hope that he will accept it, and I hope that they will listen to serious intelligence, not to politically motivated intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you this. So you, you, thank you for, for, for spending last so much question. time. Um, you know, it's very difficult to convince ordinary, average Americans that Iran is not a bad actor. You know, whether that's regionally, whether that's on the world stage, or whether that's, you know, being, you know, acting against your own people in terms of human rights abuses. Leaving aside whether, you know, whether these things are true or not, it's very difficult to convince Americans um, that you're not. So I appreciate that you've seen some of the, the facts and evidence that you've, you've been um, talking about. Um, but, you know, what, what is something that you can point to in a way that will somehow get through to you know an average American that Iran is is not this monolithically bad place that you know is trying to sow discord and confusion and you know it's simply just a normal country that has its own interests you know just like every other country. Uh, well, because the facts them, that you're stating I aren't was, getting I, through. I would ask them just to look at the facts. I mean, why are we be being blamed for for situations? where uh, U.S. allies are responsible for. These are facts. Now, uh, in our region, uh, there is a great deal of uh, suspicion about the United States. Anywhere you go, you see that suspicion about U.S. interests, about U.S. intentions, objectives. Uh, I don't know how much of it is well-founded. I know that the, uh, the uh, perceptions about Iran in the United States are based on uh, past experience, mostly the hostage crisis. But that is taken also out of context of how the Iranians at that time perceived U.S. intentions in the context of what had happened in 1953 and in the coup d'etat against a democratically elected government in Iran. So one way to deal with that, one, one way to deal with that historical baggage that we all had was to start a new phase. And I had hoped that the nuclear deal could prove that another type of interaction would be possible. We had dealt with a difficult issue, seemingly 
a, an issue that could not have been resolved diplomatically. Everybody was looking for, uh, the, I mean, was, was analyzing when this war would start between Iran and the United States. Not only we averted that, we reached a very good deal. A very good deal that does not address all my concerns, doesn't address all American concerns. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a good deal. If it addressed all my concerns, it would have been submission by the United States. If it had, had it addressed all the U.S. concerns, it would have been submission by Iran. That's why it's not submission. It's a deal. And I think, and I thought, that we could create a different example to put aside the past. Unfortunately, this administration proved that impossible. But is there no way to move beyond this impasse? I mean, to use your phrase, you know, you, you need an administration that has a different approach. Does that, that kind of imply... We need a different will... approach. We don't, we don't need an administration that has a different <laughs> approach. Um, I, I believe human beings are able to change. This administration can have a different approach. Right. So, so just, just to round that home, though, I mean, are you willing to essentially wait out the Trump administration? Uh, you know, we are he willing, might be a one-term, he might be a two-term. We, we are know. willing to wait out this approach. This approach. The, the Trump administration can change its approach. We, we don't interfere in the domestic politics of the U.S. Uh, it's, it's up to the Americans to decide who they want to have to elect as their leader. Uh, we want to see a different approach. We don't care about who, who is behind that approach. Okay. Just to rephrase it once more, though, <laughs> you know, let's, let's say there's a different president. Is, is Iran willing to talk? If there is a different approach. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.